And so since you're wholesaling, can you tell us like the biggest spread you ever got? You got the seller down to X amount of dollars and then the buyer came in and gave you X amount of dollars. What was your, first of all, what was the seller asking for with, your, with the biggest spread you ever got? Um, She was asking for 3000 Okay. You got her down to three or she was asking for three? She came out asking for three. All right, guys, this is Kelly from Hills Deals and Wheels Mobile Home Investing Course, and we got a special guest, Miss Tracy Suggs. And Tracy, thank you so much for being on here. I greatly appreciate you being on here. Can you introduce yourself to everybody? Well, thank you for having me, Kelly. I am uh, honored to be here. And yes, yeah, so I'm Tracy Suggs. I am uh, a mobile home investor out of North Carolina. I'm from Eastern North Carolina, so that's where my market is, or that's where I focus on. Um, I'm a trained uh, licensed counselor who, um, you know, I've been a teacher. I have studied to be an esthetician, all these things. Um, but mobile home investing is what I absolutely love, and it doesn't feel like work at all. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. I got two kids. The uh, one is twenty three and one is fifteen. So you know they're no longer little kids. Okay, all right. Yeah. And, and since you don't brought up the kids, are, are they um, interested in mobile home investing at all, or they're not interested? They haven't said anything, but they are a part of the journey for sure. Because we put out bandit size, and they're all uh, on board with it. So, and they, you know they work with me because it, it takes a lot of time. And so they definitely work with me. They haven't expressed any interest in it though. Okay. Okay. So Tracy, what we're really going to be talking about is um, our mobile homes, good investments. That's what we're going to talk about. So let, let me hear your answer to that, to that question. 100% yes. Okay. They are great investments um, for so many reasons, Kelly. Um, you know, they're affordable. Um, they and they provide affordable housing to others. And, you know, if you're investing in them, the cost of, you know, possible rehab repairs and stuff like that is a lot less in, in as far as cost than traditional single family homes. So they're great investments and they could just be moved. How great is that? Exactly. Yeah, I, I love that part of it. So, Tracy, you have a very interesting story on how you got into mobile home investing. It was yes. through your dad. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So my dad um, passed away in January 2023. He had lived in his double wide mobile home for over 25 years, just him. And um, when he passed, um, his financial situation um, caused me to have to quickly sell the home. Okay. And so in the process of selling the home, I did, I got a realtor and, um, but I found myself, um, helping the process along quite a bit. Uh, so I started marketing the property on Facebook marketplace. Um, I took care of the paperwork that needed to be taken care of. And I did that, um, we had to get an attorney because the home was deeded to the land. So it wasn't just the mobile home. It was, um, you know, the land as well. Um, and in the process, I was like, hmm, I could do this, you know. So and then I also, Kelly, learned when I put it on Facebook Marketplace, there was this overwhelming uh, response I mean, overwhelming. And there were so many people asking if it could be rented, if it was a rent to own option. I mean, so many. So that also opened to my eyes of there being a, a housing crisis in this area. Okay. And I was like, this is, this is a need. 
And I've always learned if you are ever able to um, address a need, then it's 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 something good for you. And mm -hmm. I learned that housing was a need in this area, affordable housing. Okay. And mm -hmm. so was that a cash deal where the buyer, the end buyer paid you cash or how did, how did that work? No. So they, um, they got a loan, they got an FHA loan. Okay. And so I had to do some things to the house for FHA to approve the loan. And so, yeah, so, um, it wasn't a cash sale per okay. se. And, and and what year, Tracy, was that mobile home? Because from what I understand, you know, especially if a mobile home has been moved too many times or a mobile home is too old, it's hard to get a loan. So what, what year was your dad's? And, and, and I first of all, I apologize about your dad passing. My dad passed away some years ago. So believe me, I know your pain. So Thanks. was it uh, what's going on with the loan? Was it was it hard to get one or what? So I wasn't privy to that part. You know, that was um, the buyer and um, their buyer's agent. So I wasn't privy to that part of it. The only part that I was privy to was the FHA loan required certain things to um, be a part of the home. Like my dad didn't have a railing on the front porch. So they required railing. They required some repairs in the house and stuff like that. And so after the repairs were done, they provided the loan and he bought the property. Okay. And did you guys, since the mobile home didn't have a title, it had a deed because it was on land. Did y'all have to close at a title company or how, how did that work? Um, with an attorney. So North Carolina is an attorney state. And so that's how we closed uh, with an attorney. Okay. And mm -hmm. so closing with an attorney, is that true with like a mobile home that's not on land or a wholesale deal? Is, is that the same in North Carolina? You need an attorney? Good question. Mm -mm. No. So you only need the attorney when it comes to the real property. And because his was deeded to the land, we had to get an attorney. But other than that, it's um, titles in North Carolina are like vehicles. And so you can close. We typically close at the uh, license plate agency or DMV for ones that aren't deeded to the land. Okay. And mm -hmm. so do you recall when your dad bought the mobile home, did he have it moved mm -hmm. to the land or, or how did that process work? Yep. He bought it brand new. Um, it was in 1997. Um, he bought it with his, at, at that time, wife, um, you know, that didn't work out. And so he just lived in the home for all this time, over 25 years by himself. And my grandmother lived with him for a while. He took care of her. Um, and it had only been moved that one time. So from the dealership, he bought it new from the dealership to the land that he had purchased. Okay. All and it was right. in great condition. Mm -hmm. And so when you move in a double Y, you know, as of today, you got to pay double the price because it's not just one move. You move in two sections. You move in two Park. sections. And mm -hmm. what people don't realize is that, uh, you know, both of the sections, well, in your dad's case, he had a deed, not a title. But if it was mm -hmm. going to be moved into a park, it will have a title for each section. Because mm -hmm. I believe it or not, Tracy, this is the funniest thing. I know somebody who bought half of a mobile home, half of a double wide. They only bought the, they only bought the A section didn't do the paperwork for the V section. And so it it was, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Okay. <laughs> you know what's <laughs> interesting? Most what's double wives have the two, like two bins or two serial numbers. He only had one. He had oh, wow. one for the two parts. And so when I was gathering the information for the realtor and I called the tax office for the bin and serial number, they because his data card was gone. I think he had painted over it or something. And um they were like, it's just one. And I was like, are you sure? Because it's mm -hmm. supposed to be two. And they right. were like, I know. <laughs> but it was now just that's one. Not, that's odd. That's very, very odd. Very odd. Yeah. So, so Tracy, what would you say your strategy is since you've been in the mobile home business? You buying and holding, renting, flipping? What are you doing? Yes. Kelly, so my strategy is to wholesale first. Um, I'm wholesaling to build capital um, so that I can buy and hold. That is the end goal. Um, 
I want several properties so that I can provide housing to families and eventually one day a park. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got you. Okay. And yeah. so Tracy, tell us the process of closing a deal when you're wholesaling, because it sounds like you've done more wholesale deals than anything else. Yeah. So w walk us through the process. Yep. So, you know, the first thing I do is I'm the in-between or I am connecting a seller with the buyer. Once that I get a seller under agreement or under contract um, for the price that we have uh, discussed or negotiated, um, then I find a buyer. I have been very lucky to um, have repeat buyers. Um, so that makes the process a whole lot easier. Um, and once I find the buyer, you know, they come and they view the property. Um, they put an offer in and typically it's what we've agreed to. Um, they understand that my fee is kind of tacked on to their price. Um, the seller knows that as well. So I'm very transparent in the process. Um, and then you you simply go to the DMV. My buyer and my seller and myself, we go to the DMV. The seller signs the back of the title. The DMV person will notarize it. The buyer signs it. They pay the fee for um, the new title and they get a little registration card and then the title will come in the mail in their name in a few weeks. It's like super easy. Okay. And, and, yeah. and what about liens in North Carolina? How do y'all check on that? Yeah, same. So typically um, on the title. So when I meet with the seller, I ask to see the title because typically the lien is listed on the title. Um, so even you can still verify that. Um, you just with the title number, you can contact the license plate agency or DMV and they will let you know if there's any liens uh, on that title. Okay. And then mm -hmm. and what what about the taxes? Who who pays for the taxes in order to transfer the title? Great question. So in the state of North Carolina, um, let's just say this year. So I had my first few deals after January 1st. So if you own the property on January 1st of that year, then you are responsible for the taxes for that year. And then the new uh, owner will be responsible January 1st of the next year. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you said you have repeat buyers. Can you expand on that? How, how does that work? Are these investors or how does that work? Yeah, yes. So they're investors. Um, I have a gentleman who um, he finds homes kind of, I guess, kind of like wholesaling. So he will find, he finds properties for his partner to buy. Okay. And he has bought uh, three of the properties that I've had for sale. Mm -hmm. And so, and he wants to know about all of them now. <laughs> so, all right. And so that makes the process a lot easier. I, I have one he's not interested in, so I'll have to find another buyer for that. But it really does help to have somebody who is like, let me know, we'll buy it. Okay. Wow, wow. Yeah. And and so Tracy, when you're talking to the seller, let's just say hypothetically the seller's wanting $20,000, you know, and I know it's not worth that. How, what is the process like? How you get them to go down? Because the more they go down, the bigger your spread is probably going to be on the buyer's end. So so how are you getting them to go down on the price? Well, that's a great question, Kelly, because that is something I was not good at in the beginning. <laughs> okay. okay. I was, um, you know, they would say, we want this. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I figured <laughs> out real quick. Okay. That's not how it works. So I started using this strategy. I will go to um, the tax website. So the GIS, Geographic Information System in that particular county, and I'll pull their tax value or their, the property tax value. Okay. And that humbles them very quickly because they typically they want more than what the property is valued at. And so I use that as a tool to negotiate. And then I also pull in like Facebook Marketplace, um, 
properties that with the same, you know, bed, bath, same single, double. Um, and also I go to the MH Village site and I pull like the properties that have sold in the prices. So I, I, I bring in tools to help me negotiate with them because you cannot just, in my opinion, it's more difficult to negotiate just cold. You know, people need to see things right. in order to be like, okay, well, I get it. And um, that hasn't always worked. I have a double wide right now. Well, it's not under contract, but it was a seller who reached out and, excuse me, they wanted 89000 for it. It's double wide in land. And the property value for the land and the double wide is 57000 Wow. And so I showed them that, yeah. I showed them that and I said, you know, it would be very difficult to get more than about fifty eight, fifty nine thousand for this, you know, just being real with them. And they were like, no, we can't do that. And I was like, yeah, I understand. So it, it also means walking away, you know, if it, if the numbers just don't make sense, because if I get a property under contract for uh, an amount that just doesn't make sense, it's just going to sit there. You know, right. people won't edit that. So, mm -hmm. and yeah. so, uh, even though you're looking at the GIS, which I have used that a couple of times myself, you still mm -hmm. got to look at what's going on inside the house as far as repairs. I mean, because you know, you know, it could tell you all day long it's worth fifty, but when you go inside, it might be, it might be a night, it might be a nightmare. So, yeah, yeah. Definitely. okay. Okay. And so since you're wholesaling, can you tell us like the biggest spread you ever got? You got the seller down to X amount of dollars and then the buyer came in and gave you X amount of dollars. What was your, first of all, what was the seller asking for with, your, with the biggest spread you ever got? Um, She was asking for 3000 Okay. You got her down to three or she was asking for three? She came out asking for three. Okay, Tracy, how do you get <laughs> You didn't need to talk her down, did you? Not at all. I actually gave her more. Because wow. she Yeah, I gave her more because she was so humble and she was she was moving after all this time she bought the property new. She lived in it, raised her daughter in it, and then she she finally she moved out of that part. And I was like, "Well, what do you want to walk away with?" She was like 3,000. And in my head, this is on the phone in my head, I was like, Huh? Wow. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I went and saw it. it was nice. They did have some root damage, but she had kept it pristine. Okay. And this is the 1999 single wide. And uh yeah, she wanted three thousand, so I gave her four thousand. Mm -hmm. Why so you got me? I'm like, why so cheap? Why Wow. That's all she wanted. I didn't even ask, Kelly. If I started asking questions. <laughs> wow. But wow. that's all she said she wanted. And, um, and I ended up selling it for 11000 Wow. That's amazing. That is yeah. amazing. So you didn't even have to talk her down. And, and you got this spread without even owning the home. You got the spread because you knew the seller. You got the seller under contract. And then mm -hmm. you turn around and found a buyer. So when you're getting the seller under contract, do you allow them to still advertise their own home if they had been advertising before? No. Um, if they are advertising their home, I try not to really deal with them because if they've already put something out there, then I think it's difficult to reel that back in and say, oh, now, you know, we're selling this for this amount. Um, so I luckily have not had any seller who had already marketed their own property okay mm -hmm. all right all right and so now we're talking about the buyer how mm -hmm. do you make sure that you know after you do and it's not a whole lot of paperwork after you do all the paperwork yeah. or whatever how do you make sure that they got the eleven thousand dollars um up until this point i'll be super honest um I have never verified it. I do request a deposit. Okay. So that's the first thing I do. I request a deposit and I request an amount that for me, if you can give me this amount, then I 
would think that you would have the remaining. Okay. So that's the strategy I have used. Um, it has worked so far. Um, hopefully it'll continue to work. Okay. So I don't re request like any verification of funds or anything like that okay. right now. All right. So Tracy, that deposit that you got, you got it only after you found the mobile home or you got it beforehand? Um, so the deposit is obtained from the buyer. So once a buyer comes to the open house, so what I do is I hold an open house um, and I try to hold it where I have everybody come to the open house. And, um, you know, the first person that comes and says they want it and they're willing to pay what I am listing it for, then I request a deposit from them at that time. Like they have to give me that deposit that day. And most people actually come to these showings with money. You know, they come with deposit. They come deposit ready. Okay. And, and how much of a deposit did you ask on this particular home? On this one, it was 3000 3000 Okay. Mm -hmm. And so at what point do you contact the mobile home park manager and let them know what your plans are. Yep. So um, this one, this, this park is a lax. Um, so I knew that it wouldn't be any issues. Um, so once I got the deposit from the buyer, I contacted the park uh, owner. This is the owner and let them know like, hey, you know, this seller will be selling the home, but the park is remaining in the park. Um, and this person will be living in the park. Well, this particular park owner was like, okay, well, just give me their name, their their phone number, the address, their email, and send them this letter from my attorney that tells them like the park rules and where to send the lot rent check. Done. Wow. Um, <laughs> but for a park that's a little bit more uh, stringent, I guess you'll say, um, I would always let the potential buyer know that, you know, you do have to be park approved. So, you know, it, and I always get the park uh, requirements prior to the showing. So I let them know, look, this is what the park is going to require. So if you give me the deposit, you know, you're giving me the deposit with knowing that you would be approved when you apply to this park. Mm -hmm. um, I do say that a portion of the money is non-refundable, but most of the time, if someone is not approved by the park, I had an incident or situation, I guess, um, in a county over next to mine where the park didn't approve someone who had given me a deposit and I just gave them their money back because it wasn't a small deposit. So gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so how are you finding these uh mobile homes? Are you driving for dollars or what are you doing? No, I don't drive for I have driven for dollars, but I never find anything driving for dollars. These are all mostly from bandit signs. Okay. Um, and I've done a few or a couple collabs. So I've done two that were collabs with uh, other investors. Okay. And All so right. they brought th those deals. Okay. And Tracy, they collaborated with you because they didn't live close to where the deal was or how did that work? Yep, exactly. So they live about three hours away. Um, and so, and they, the deal was in my area. And so they knew I was in this area and ready. All right. All right. So and, and Tracy, before we had got on here, you said you were pretty much a newbie. You have only been in the mobile home business for how long? <laughs> um, I started uh, the end of 2023. I took a, uh, thir a 30 day, yeah, 30 day boot camp um that literally changed my life um i started doing all the things to and it was a wholesaling mobile home boot camp so i started doing all the things i needed to do to basically get the business off the ground um i started marketing but it was like right before the holiday so it was dead mm -hmm. um and then january came and that's i mean first contract came or first 
seller under contract first week of January. And then the next one came the next week. And the next one came a couple weeks later. So it was uh, really quick. So I'm a newbie newbie. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. So Tracy, when you say you started marketing, are we referring to ghost ads or what are we talking about marketing? Yep. I put out one ghost ad and the rest were bandit signs, mm -hmm. all bandit signs. And the calls that I received were from the bandit signs. Um, not much from virtual marketing yet because I'm still doing that. I don't get much feedback from that. It's the bandit signs. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, and when you close, when you close these deals, are you ever keeping the buyer and the seller from meeting or you don't care? I, I'm not skilled enough yet to do that. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, we, we all meet. I do make sure I'm there first. Um, and then I'll just introduce them. They come at the same time. They know what's going on. So it, and it works out. You know, they just, they're like, hey, they're both excited. Like, I'm so glad you buy my house and I'm so glad to buy it. Um, so it, it just goes that way for me. And so far, I haven't had any issues. It's gone really smoothly. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and how do you go about marketing your open houses? How, how, how much of a time do you get to post that? Where do you post that? Mm -hmm. walk, walk us through how that, how that works. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I use Facebook Marketplace. It is it is the place to go to market. It's, it's like the new um, yard sale, you know. So I um, I post it on Facebook Marketplace. Um, I'll post the actual uh, listing. And then a couple of days later, I'll post on that listing or update that listing with the actual open house. Um, and, you know, just letting everybody know to be this time. Um, typically what I do is I'll let them know to contact me about an hour before if they plan to attend so that I could send them the address to the property. Um, because, you know, I don't want anybody showing up to somebody's house, especially if it's still occupied prior to me getting there and being able to navigate traffic and all of that. Mm hmm. OK. And it's funny you said you you hold off on the address because I do the same thing because I, I had a section tenant a section eight tenant about to move out and I had posted the house like fifteen days you know before she left and people had the nerve to knock on the door I know you're leaving in fifteen days but can I take a peek in I'm like are you are you serious so I wind up having to take the advertisement down so yeah I do the same thing I, I'm not posting no address I just give you a general idea where the park is but I'm not yes. doing the addresses mm -hmm. so be besides your father's deal mm -hmm. have you done any other mobile homes on land or are you strictly inside of a park I have one right now that I have on land, which was the first one. It was the very first one I got under contract and it was sorely overpriced and it's still sitting. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is that, and is so, that empty or is what's going it's on? Empty. Yeah, it's empty. It's not tenant occupied or anything. And so um, the seller owns multiple properties so he's not really in a rush you know it's not a motivated seller type thing he just wants to sell it and so his price is just not um realistic in this area okay. so i have finally gotten him down and luckily i have a buyer who is my repeat buyer who first told me that he did not want it because of all the repairs and now he he and a partner are going to buy it. And it's okay. with land. So I have to do the same process that I had to go through with my dad's house. And, you know, I was I was so like antsy and frantic during that time. Like, oh my God, oh my God, you know, what am I doing? And I had a realtor, mind you. That's a different uh -huh. story. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, but it was preparing me for this and I had no idea so now I don't feel anxious about it or involving an attorney you know I was you know I still have questions and I've got a great um mentor that okay. assists with that and um but I'm not scared of it we just you know 
get it done. So now I'll be able to close on that one finally, but it's the only one that I've had on land. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. <laughs> and, and besides this challenge, have you had any more challenges since you've been in the mobile home investing business? Yes. Um, I still work full time. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. Me too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I still work full time, Kelly, and it is um, it's a balancing act. And then I'm a mom, so um, oh, I work all the time. Okay, you know, I work all the time, and um, but it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is a big challenge. Um. Well, I think I said in the beginning, like negotiating, negotiating was a challenge in the beginning because like I'm not a seller, you know, I'm not, yeah. you know, somebody came to me and said, um, oh, God, I just when I was in high school, we had to sell fruit for the band to go on these big trips. I never sold it because who am I going to No, I don't sell things. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I had to learn real quick that um, I had better negotiate to sell these homes or else, you know, it will be pointless for me to actually do it. Um, right. So that's one thing. Um, gosh, in, in having a coach, um, mm. if I did not have a coach, I wouldn't have been able to, um, go along as quick as I did when I, I started going. So I encourage any in, uh, mobile home investor who's serious to seek out, I would call it counsel. Um, right. Because it's, uh, it's needed. There's so many moving pieces and you have to have that. And you also have to have support because, you know, you may feel like you're not doing it right or if it's just it's just not working you need somebody to be like it's okay you know chill right. out Let's go you know so yeah so tracy i'm glad you brought up the coach part do you think you could have done this by just getting on youtube university and, and piecing some stuff together do you think seriously you'd be able to do that maybe kelly mm -hmm. but it would take longer okay yeah it yeah. would take longer and I've realized um, just in life, if you want to do something that you don't have like a knowledge base on, then the very best thing for you to do is to seek counsel mm -hmm. um, and support throughout that journey because um, you're going to make mistakes. I still made mistakes, but I was able to talk through those mistakes and not make them again and then maybe not make some mistakes I would have made. So I would wholeheartedly suggest, you know, the investment because you're mm -hmm. investing in yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. So in North Carolina, do you got, and th this has been a fear of so many students, so many newbies. Number one, they're afraid to talk to the park manager. And then number two, somehow somebody put it in their head that even if you wholesale, you need a license. Are you licensed, Tracy, to no. to be the wholesale? You don't have to have a license, correct? No, we don't have to have one, correct. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And so where do you find yourself in the licensing space? Are you planning on doing that or what do you think? Not really, no. Um, if it ever became a requirement, then I would definitely comply. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a requirement. And, um, you know, just as long as I make sure that I'm doing everything correctly, um, then, you know, I think I'll be fine. But yeah, if it ever came to that, I definitely comply. Okay. All right. And so Tracy, you know, we recently had this pandemic with COVID and all that good stuff. And I tell anybody, <laughs> They were giving away these mobile homes like hotcakes. This is how me and my brother got so many properties. Uh, you weren't quite in the mobile home business during the pandemic. But if the pandemic was to hit again, wh where would you be? You Do you think you would suffer or, or you know, the wholesale deals wouldn't be that plentiful? Or wh where would you be? Mm. Um, I think I think life would still be moving, Kelly. Mm -hmm. And I think people would still need um, affordable housing. And I think people would probably more than ever 
um, also be motivated to sell okay. maybe for money. Mm. Um, so I would have jumped in like you and your brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have yeah. kept going. I would keep going if it ever get, came to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, Tracy, it's so obvious that you didn't have analysis paralysis, but do you have any advice to somebody who's new to this business who might be like, because I, I, I can I can tell you so many times people have taken 50 million courses and read all these books and still ain't took no action. Do you have any advice for somebody like that? Just do it. Just do it. You know, mm -hmm. um, you're going to make mistakes. Um, you're going to feel unsure. All of that is par for the course, you know, because mm -hmm. I still felt that way. But I was determined that I wasn't going to quit. I said, I can't quit. You know, this mm -hmm. is something I have to do. I have to build freedom for myself. And if I don't do this right now, when am I going to do it? So fear can't paralyze me or, you know, analyzing too much cannot paralyze me because this is what I know I have to do. Like my, it's almost like my dad was like, here you go. This is what you need to do. You've been wanting to know. Here you go. Uh -huh. I'll help you, you know? And so I felt like this was it, you know, and I just did it scared and all. I was scared. Uh -huh. But I did um, it. Okay. And, and mm -hmm. so, Tracy, you mentioned, you know, you learned how to be a better negotiator. And the main reason for that is because that spread was very thin. Probably when somebody said, oh, give me 10000 And you know the house wasn't worth ten. Then you yes. found somebody maybe going to give you 10500 So you only got $500. Mm -hmm. is, is that why you your negotiation skills got a little better? Oh, yes, ma'am. Real okay. quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, Tracy, you mentioned earlier that you have done some JVs with some people. If somebody were to reach out to you, is that something that you would be interested in? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. Um, those, those have been great, you know, um, to do. And I know the process. And so I just kind of zip through it, you know, and collaborate with them as I need um, to. And um I love I love that piece of things too. That's what I learned in this business. It is not silos. Like you cannot stand on an island and just be, you know, just do you. Like this is a whole collaborative effort and uh it's a beautiful thing. Okay. And so Tracy, I know you mentioned the realtor that you had that was helping you with your dad. Do you mm -hmm. really think the realtors have a, a full concept of what's uh, going on with these mobile homes or what are your thoughts? I don't know, Kelly. I know that they don't usually like to touch mobile homes. I know mm -hmm. that. Why? I mean, maybe I don't I don't fully know. Um honestly, in his situation, I think he had a lot going on. Gotcha. Gotcha. And he yeah, he just had a lot going on. And so okay. I learned real quick or realized very quickly that if I was going to sell this home before foreclosure, that I had to take it into my own hands. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Because I know some states have a cap as to how many uh, mobile homes a realtor can help buy and sell. I already know that. So that's probably why they don't have a lot of experience in it. So Yeah. And so, that's true for North Carolina too. Yeah. So, Tracy, would you say that uh, the mobile home market is saturated? Because I hear people say, oh, there's a lot of people doing it now. What are your, what are your thoughts regarding that? Um, I would say I don't think it's oversaturated. I think more people are jumping into the business. But I don't think they're maybe consistent. I don't think. You know, even if they delve into it, I don't think that they stay in it long term. I think like there's just some people that will stick with it. Um, so I don't I don't think it's oversaturated. And even if it were to me, it wouldn't bother me because I feel like my drive and um my go, you know, is is going to uh, feed me 
Gotcha. Um, so feed me the deals and, and all these things. And plus, because my heart is pure and I really just want to help people. So I don't think it is, but even if it were, it wouldn't bother me. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. So Tracy, I greatly appreciate you being on here, guys. We have Miss Tracy Suggs. Um, uh, and she says she's a new mobile home investor. I wouldn't say new. You've been in the business over a year and you you killing the game. So Tracy, how would somebody get in contact with you if they want to do a joint venture with you? If you're interested in that, do you have an email, a website, a phone number you want to share with them? Yeah, definitely. So um you could contact me via phone, two five two. Five six five seven nine five nine, and then you could also email me at we buy mobile homes two five two at gmail dot com. Okay, and my and so Facebook Tr handle is Tracy Subs. Yeah. Okay, and so Tracy, you say we buy mobile homes. Is there uh -huh. really a, is it really a we? Or are you you doing this <laughs> by yourself? Solo. Yeah, it is definitely an I. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I just want to make sure. I got you. I yeah. got you. All right, guys. This is Kelly from Hills, Deals, and Wheels Mobile Home Investing Course. There you got it. Mrs. Tracy Suggs. I'm going to call her an experienced mobile home investor. Tracy, thank you so much for being on here. I greatly appreciate it. And we're going to stay in contact. We're going to stay in contact. Okay. <laughs>